Tanafa has always um, taken the stance that um, we have the knowledge and the resources, meaning um, the uh, people and um, maybe the natural resources in our own communities to um, address um, our challenges with, you know, and our solutions from, uh, from within our own um, traditional knowledge base and culture. So with this series that we're, um, we're gonna be putting together is um, um, going to be, I, I believe, six or eight um, 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 uh, programs, webinars, and um, I'll be posting those uh, along with um, uh, NAFSA as we uh, confirm them. We have another one starting next week on uh, cooperative uh, farming. Um, <clears throat> normally, uh, when we meet, do things live uh, in our communities, we start with a prayer. We, I won't say we don't have enough time at this moment, but what I did uh, is earlier uh, uh, this, in this day, um, I offered a prayer for, um, for everyone and that things will go well for us today. Uh, like I said, we have, it's a collaboration with um, Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance and um, Kaylee is our host uh, on this webinar. And we have uh, Colleen Cooley, uh, she's um, um, a support person and the uh, presenter today is uh, Lillian Hill. Um, and ho hope everybody will um, join in with us. Uh, we have, um, I guess, there'll be a way of um, um, asking questions or uh, providing some feedback through a chat. I don't know exactly how that works myself. We will also be, um, or offering door prize, um, actually prizes um, for people that are attending today. Um, we have some uh, Native American products, uh, some roasted blue cornmeal it comes from a, a farm family, uh, family farm just north of us in Oke Wingay. They also provided some uh, nice red hot chili powder, um, some kota tea, and uh, some uh, raw honey from uh, Zia bees. So I'll hand it over to um, uh, Leah at this, at, at this time. Good, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kaylee Warren. I'm Tewa and Tiwa from the Pueblos of Santa Clara and Isleta. And I'm the communications coordinator for NAFSA, the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. We are so honored to be helping Clayton and NAFSA to present this series and so excited that you all have joined us today. NAFSA is a national network of indigenous leaders dedicated to restoring dynamic food systems that support tribal self-determination and community wellness. Our organization brings together proven strategies rooted in traditional practices with innovative collaboration to support local food production that protects natural resources while enhancing uh, traditional cultural activities and mentoring new generations of native food sovereignty activists, chefs, farmers, and practitioners. Um, if you'd like to learn more about what we do as well as the work of the other two organizations who are involved in the presentation of today's webinar, We'll be sharing everyone's websites and Instagram handles in the chat for your reference uh, shortly. So uh, to give you an idea of what the next hour and a half is going to look like, once we wrap up our brief introductions here, we're gonna jump right into Lillian's presentation for an hour. And then we'll conclude with a question and answer session and some door prizes as Clayton said. Um, just a bit of housekeeping out of consideration 
for everyone we're sharing this space with and the time of our presenter. We'd encourage you all to ask any questions you have for Lillian using the Q&A box instead of the chat. We have allocated 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for a discussion, and we'll choose the questions with the most upvotes to ask her at that time. Um, so as we have talked about, uh, in gratitude to you all for your interest and for taking the time to be here, we have four door prizes to give today. Uh, the first has already been awarded uh, to the first person who we saw join in. The second and third will be given to two people who are the first to answer two questions we'll be asking at the end of the webinar based on the content of Lillian's presentation. Um, and the fourth will be a randomly chosen name from the folks who ask a question today. Um, and so Clayton has generously offered to provide some traditional food products and some some pieces of his harvest. And so if you win one of these door prizes, we will be in contact with you after the webinar to receive your mailing information. So with that, I'll just thank you all again for joining us and I'll hand it back over to Clayton to introduce Lillian. Um, thank you all again. Thank you, Leah. Um, Looks like we're getting more and more people joining us uh, now. That's great. Um, Lillian Hill um, works out there in uh, one of the probably some of the harshest environments that we're going to um, that we can see in uh, North America and maybe throughout throughout the whole world too. Um, high desert. <clears throat> They're probably very cold right now. Um, and uh, very limited um, moisture, meaning rain or snow. And they've been able to um, uh, make a living, I'll say, but also um, um, uh, not just make a living, but um, I guess um, create a, um, an environment that um, provides food, health, uh, economy and um, I guess a, a, a healthy living, which is, um, you know, to me that's the epitome of um, of our uh, you know our life. We if we can uh, create a healthy environment and uh, uh, joy and happiness for our families. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to Lillian Hill, and she can um, uh, speak more of her work um and um enjoy the rest of this presentation thank you everyone great thank you so much clayton for that introduction and thank you um everyone who has made this event possible here i am Good to see you all. Uh, greetings to, to everyone here on the webinar today, all of my relatives who have joined in from different parts of, um, of our Mother Earth here that we live on. Um, I'm joining you from uh, my traditional homeland, which is on the Hopi Reservation. And um, my name is Lillian Hill. Um, my Hopi name is Kwanhoinem, and I am tobacco clan from the village of Kikotsmovi. And I'm um, excited today to share with you all um, some knowledge that I've gained over the past few years and even over a decade um, in the work that I've been doing here in my own community. And I feel honored to be able to be here to share that with you today. So I am going to share my screen with you all and we'll get started for the day. Apologies, my computer's a little slow. I think it's on its way out. So it's gonna take a little bit to, to get set up here. Okay, oops, now it's moving forward. Okay, great. Okay, so today I'm going to be sharing with you all um, 
some information on um, growing an indigenous food forest. And I'll be sharing with you mainly um, based on my own experience here in the high uh, desert country where I have been raised and where I grow up and where I continue to live. And I'll also share with you um, some basic concepts of um, food forests and a few permaculture uh, methods and techniques, um, different concepts that I have um, learned from my own teachers and mentors and others um, within my own community. So I just wanna again acknowledge the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, the Traditional Native American Farmers Association and the Hopi Tetsua Permaculture Institute for hosting um, this webinar today. Today, we're gonna to cover quite a few topics as we move forward. Um, and since we are limited on time today, um, I just want to um, let you know that I'll probably be moving a little bit fast through some of these more technical aspects um, in order to uh, make sure that I'm you know, okay on time as we move forward. So if um, at any time you may have questions, go ahead and put them in the question and answer and I'll do my best to um, go ahead and, and answer those for you. Okay, so, <clears throat> So as for myself, um, myself and my husband Hakobo founded the Hopi Tetsuka Permaculture Institute here in, on the Hopi Reservation to support Hopi youth and community in developing skills and practical experience to encourage a healthy Hopi community. And along with our children and extended family, we currently caretake a two acre permaculture living learning site, which is located uh, in the village of Kikotsmobi. Uh, we are both certified permaculture designers, natural builders, uh, rainwater harvesters, and beekeepers. Um, and together we strive to nurture a new generation of indigenous earth stewards that will continue to carry on traditional agriculture and teachings. Uh, the mission of the organization that we currently work with and that we founded it um, is basically the organization is a community indigenous led nonprofit that's based um, on the Hopi reservation. And our mission is to create community based solutions in order to pass knowledge to future generations and rebuild uh, generative and healthy communities and the photo that you see in the background is actually uh, the one of the villages where my um, where my great grandparents come from, which is the village of uh, Old Oraibi or Oraibi. And it's um, one of the oldest continuously inhabited villages in North America. And as you see on top of the Mesa, that's where um, a lot of our villages are located on top of the Mesa. And as you look down below the Mesa, um, many of our fields and farms are actually located um, down below the Mesas as well as our orchards. Um, and then if you were to glance a little bit to the left, that's actually where I am right now, um, where I'm located. So as a, as an organization, as a community group, um, we do have a commitment to, um, to heal and decolonize um, ourselves and the work that we do. And so we are working to transform and transcend our hearts and minds beyond uh, the confines of colonization to change our collective outlook towards life, to awaken, rejuvenate, and reimagine our communities. So as a organization, we represent um, many, many individuals, youth, um, farmers, families, and others within our community who are all working cooperatively um, to uh, restore our uh, culture, our language, and our life ways as we move forward. So I'm going to be sharing with you a few um, elements that are kind of versed in this idea of permaculture. And I know that um, permaculture as a, um, as a discipline um, within its methods, there are some um, you know, challenges that are associated with us as indigenous people having our own traditional uh, world's view and our own um, pathways and our own methods of um, the way that we grow food, the way that we take care of the land. Um, I was introduced to permaculture by a mentor uh, who is no longer with us, but um, who started um, an indigenous permaculture center on the Navajo Nation. Um, his name was Justin Willie, and 
he was very passionate about um, the work that he was doing to rebuild um, food systems on the Navajo Nation and to utilize permaculture as a platform to be able to articulate um, traditional Navajo worldview and also to teach the next generation um, different techniques and methods to restore um, to restore the land and the water as well. So um, permaculture as a discipline is a holistic design system that's utilized around the world to build beautiful natural homes, to grow nutritious food, harvest rainwater, revive deserts and build um, sustainable regenerative communities. Our indigenous ancestors actually created these strategies that are embedded in permaculture itself. Um, and these strategies enabled our communities to live and thrive in our own unique traditional territories and ecosystems. And so the work that we do as an institute, as an organization is to strive to honor our ancestral teachings and to continue to learn and implement the practices that have been handed down um, to our generation as we move forward as well. So as we move um, into um, looking at and learning about um, food forest or forest gardens, it's important to understand and to realize that um, within our own indigenous uh, communities, within our own indigenous territories, we have um, ancestral knowledge that has enabled us as, um, as native people to, um, to be able to steward the land itself. And so this knowledge is embedded um, in our practices and it's been handed down um, for many, many generations. Um, and we can still see that in the landscape on the land itself um, in areas that have been uh, recently occupied through uh, colonization and through land theft and through the displacement of our communities and people. And we see those um, ancestral practices and the ways that our traditional, um, our people traditionally steward the land in that um, when we visit areas, um, our forests, when we visit the land, we see the places where they left their footprints. We see the various different um, foods that they cultivated and they managed um, throughout the landscape as well. Um, within our uh, heritage systems, we've our people have developed these dynamic agriculture, agricultural systems that have enabled us to have um, a high level of health to be able to be, um, you know, in a, in a situation where we can not only survive, but also thrive, and that our entire physio physiological aspects of our, um, of our bodies adapt it to that as well. Um, within our um, agricultural systems, we've developed regenerative practices um, that enabled uh, us to be a part of uh, the, our food sheds and our watersheds as well. Um, these regenerative land use practices um, include the, um, the widespread management of forests, of riverways, of developing, um, you know, um, connections with herds and with different cycles of um, and patterns of movement of natural wildlife and of as well um, ourselves as indigenous people and how we relate to the land and the scale by which um, we have developed these forest gardens is, is really immense and we can see that within um, you know within the different territories that we live in and so when we think about forest gardens, indigenous forest gardens, we look at them as being multi-dimensional um, tapestries. So um, if we look at these natural systems, the natural systems that we live in and the natural systems that enable us to have everything that we need to thrive and survive, we look at these um, systems as, as having layers, as having um, relationships that are complex and these relationships um, are, are uh, reciprocal. Um, and also um, when we look at food forests, we also um, uh, look at food sheds and watersheds. So, so basically within, um, within our, our territories, we have multiple scales of food production that increase um, resiliency for, for our uh, communities, for our people. And um, also when we look at food forests, we have to also um, be clear that 
wherever we exist um, in the world, our um, experience with our uh, food shed and watershed is based on our regional ecology. Um, and food forests definitely have um, different characteristics in that um, we're looking at vegetation um, architecture, we're looking at the way that the, the forests themselves grow, the different layers, the different uh, canopies, the different plants that grow. Um, we look at the vegetation dynamics, uh, the way that plants grow together, the way that they support each other, um, and the structure of, of those plants and of the forest and of the living um, microbiology as well. So I'm going to be going, I'm a real um, soil nerd, and I'm a nerd in all things um, that relate to agriculture. And so I'm going to be using some terms that are a little bit different from the terms that we use um, potentially in our own communities, but I'll, I'll definitely, as we move forward, um, try to define those terms a little bit more. Um, within our traditional language, um, within my traditional language that I utilize, we have um, ways to describe uh, the connections between um, plants, the connections um, when we're harvesting plants, the, the proper relationships and the proper offerings and prayers that we give. And so, um, and, and so that language is a little bit different from English. So I do apologize if, um, if I'm not able to communicate um, in, in the way that I um, normally do in my own language, but I'll, I'll try the best that I can in this, um, in this flawed English language that we have. Um, so when we look at food forests um, and we look at our own indigenous practice um, as stewards of the land, we look at the, um, the Amazon rainforest being one of the most extensive food forests um, on the planet itself. And um, within the Amazon basin um, and within the rainforest that exists in subtropical regions, um, these regions actually contain all of the different elements of a healthy, thriving forest itself. And so if we look also into the traditional teachings and the stories um, and dances and songs of our own, uh, within our own communities, we also see that our, um, that Indigenous people have um, developed specific methods and techniques to cultivate healthy soils within uh, these regions and that we um, as Indigenous people actually have um, spent a significant amount of time nurturing uh, these large um, forest regions and that we continue, uh, our people and our communities continue to manage and continue to nurture these um, forests and these regions despite the immense challenges that we face with um, displacement, with continued colonization and with continued um, threats to our way of life. And so within, um, within the Amazon, you see a living, breathing um, forest that was cultivated, was planted and, and man continues to be managed by indigenous peoples that live and thrive in, in those different regions. Um, and I mentioned this place not only because um, the Amazon forest itself represents the pinnacle of um, of uh, food and forest agroecology, but it also represents um, an origin or a migration point for a lot of Pueblo communities um, and, and a lot of clans as well. Um, my own clan, the Tobacco Clan, we live um, within an, an arid region here in the high Mesa areas in Arizona, but we, in our stories and in our culture and legends, um, uh, we emerged and we came from um, from this place, from a place place of lushness, and that's where um, we were able to gather and, and make a relationship with the tobacco to bring up to where we are right now. And so I feel like, um, along with some of those ancestral connections that we have, we also have the knowledge um, if we dig deep and if we really are able to understand our connection. Um, to the land itself that we carry the knowledge to be able to endure and to develop um, thriving and resilient systems that will not only feed us and nourish us, but that will be stable and resilient for future generations that are going to come after us. And I think that that's what our um, ancestors have always did was they, they've always thought about us and um, they've, they've always worked towards ensuring that we um, we're going to be okay. So if we look into the technical aspects um, of 
food forest and I apologize some of these photos aren't um, they're not very clear but we look at different terms like guilds um, which guilds are small ecosystems and guilds basically are um, are are different plants that um, grow together in natural ecosystems. Um, they're mutually, they have um, mutual bene mutually beneficial relationships with each other and they have developed interdependence. And so when we look at guilds, um, wherever you are in the world um, and within your natural um, living systems that you interact with, you can probably look around and identify um, some of those guilds that are within your own area. Um, one of the guilds that I, uh, oh, that I am actually um, a part of and a guild that I visit uh, most frequently is the uh, Gamble Oak Guild, which is located near the um, Ponderosa Pine Forest below um, the mountain, the San Francisco Peaks here in Northern Arizona. And within this guild, you can see um, Gamble Oak um, acorns. Uh, down below that, you can um, see banana yucca, prickly pear cactuses, um, currants. There's a lot of different um, plants that are growing within that area, and all of these plants um, help each other, and they all have um, ben beneficial ways that they um, ensure each other's um, survival within that region and within that territory. Um, Earth Mother creates numerous guilds by design, so wherever you are, there are guilds that exist in nature and they exist um, all over um, Mother Earth and, and she herself has, um, has designed and has um, expressed those guilds as well. Um, there's also human designed guilds that exist um, within um, all of our territories as well, so if you look at um, guilds that have been planted and those are the guilds that I'm actually going to share with you today. Uh, myself and my family and uh, community have designed um, some guilds that we um, are planting and utilizing right now. And some of the largest, I, I guess, large scale guilds that you'll see are called geoglyphs, which are basically um, large scale um, guilds that are created um, in conjunction with rainwater harvesting earthworks and a lot of those geoglyphs you can see um, you know some of the most popular ones are located in again the Amazon rainforest as well as uh, Machu Picchu and different parts of South America, Central America and also here in the southwest um, and those guilds are only seen, um, you can see them, you know, every day by walking through them, but the larger scale earthworks that exist within these geoglyphs can only be seen um, if you were a bird flying over the land, or if you were an airplane flying over the land, and those have been um, documented, and they continue to be documented, and many of those geoglyphs are actually um, made in pattern, uh, in the patterns of um, you know, sacred animals or sacred entities that exist within our um, within our own culture and within our stories. So, um, so our ancestors back in the day were not only creating um, human design guilds; they were also uh, massively engaged in large scale um, rainwater um, harvesting and and their um, human design guilds were mimicking um, sacred uh, geometry and sacred um, patterns and designs that we have within our um, ceremonies as well. Um, these guilds provide a roadmap for us as we move forward um, and as we develop our, um, our own practice of um, stewarding the land or of developing our, um, our agricultural systems. So guilds themselves will give you an indication of, of how um, things grow within a natural living system. And the more that you're able to identify those different plants and how they grow together and how they complement each other, um, those will provide you a roadmap for adding to those guilds or, or for de designing and creating your own guilds as well. Um, and the guilds themselves um, represent resilience and vigor. And so if you look at natural systems and all of these plants that grow in proximity to each other, they all um, demonstrate a high um, level of resilience, um, meaning that they endure without um, humans really being out there watering them or without humans um, 
you know, actively irrigating or taking care of them. Um, and they actually thrive with, with human inter interaction. So as you harvest, as you gather, um, that stimulates um, the growth of these guilds and the vigor of, of the guilds themselves. And so I'll share um, some of those systems and some of those human design guilds, human design guilds with you. Um, as we look at, um, you know, this concept of food forest or forest gardening, um, we look at um, the concepts of, of layering, layers of life that, um, that, are, that, that exists within these systems. And so within food forest, um, these are self-generating systems, um, meaning that once they're established and once they're fully able to express themselves, they, um, they regenerate themselves. So the trees drop, um, they produce fruit sometimes and the, the plants down below produce seeds. And those seeds and fruit are eaten by birds and different insects and they drop um, or by humans and they drop and they're, they're distributed. And then they're also regenerated within that system, meaning that they grow or, or they express themselves or it's just a self-generating system where, um, where again, um, it, it, humans themselves, um, it, they're not dependent on humans, um, these systems. Um, they're also stable ecosystems where um, if, if there's any changes within the climate or changes um, within the natural cycles, that these ecosystems themselves can endure and stabilize to the point where they can endure indefinitely. Um, and also in, in many instances um, for many, many generations, um, hundreds and thousands of years as well. So that's basically the, the goal um, and, and the uh, manifestation of a food forest is that um, it's self-regenerating, it's stable, and it will endure um, for a very long time um, if it's able to express itself. And if, you know, um, these elements are, all of these different elements that we'll go through are, are there. So there's different, um, there's different layers that are, um, different layers of a food forest. Um, one of them, the highest, and these are vertical layers many times, vertical and also um, horizontal layers of growth. And so when you look at food forests, the very top layer is, is a canopy layer. It's a large tree layer um, that basically um, can be as tall as, um, you know, 50 to 75 feet and even taller in subtropical regions. And these canopy trees um, are actually um, uh, within the canopy trees, there's the vines and climbers that actually climb up to the tree and create, um, you know, ecosystems and create microclimates for other um, for other life forms to to live and to thrive. Um, there's also an understory within the canopy, um, an understory which consists of shrubs, of herbs, of different clumping plants. Um, and those could be um, grasses and other um, plants that like to clump. Um, there's ground cover and creepers, those plants that like to um, creep over the ground, over the land itself. Um, there's the rhizosphere layer, which is the root layer um, of, of the forest itself. Um, there's significant fungal layers and also microbiological layers. Um, and those fungal and microbiological layers are important because they actually help to build and develop um, a soil that can um, endure over a long period of time and that can um, provide the foundation for um, these types of systems to really not only thrive but to continue to express themselves as they change and as they um, move towards um, this, this successive pattern. So when we look at um, a food forest, there's an entire living web that exists um, and this web is very, very complex. Um, and again, um, from the smallest elements within the fungal and bacterial layers in the, the soil, there's just so much happening within um, that layer, within that level itself. And there's so many different types of um, bacteria that, um, that emerge that are developed within that soil layer. And also there's um, many different processes and things that are happening um, once the bacterial and the fungal layer are able to 
um, to be developed and able to emerge and to grow. And those elements are actually the most important elements because they're the ones that are actually not only building soil, but they're also, um, you know, the, the elements that are responsible for storing water, for cleaning water, um, for slowing water down, and for developing um, real health in trees, plants, and their um, life that is going to be growing within that um, within that system itself. So there's these elements are very very complex, and once you begin to cultivate them and begin to um, interact with them and 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 to um, and to just be a part of be a part of them all together you, you'll really begin to understand how they work and and what they um, what they go through their processes and for me I look at these little critters as being things that I can't see but I know they're there and I know that they have their own life. Um, some of them, if you look at them under a microscope, some of them move very fast over a microscope. Some of them move very slow. They have different ways and different um, different characteristics as well. So, um, and they're living um, beings. So it's it's very fascinating. And if you ever are interested in um, soil microbiology, I encourage um, folks to. To, to learn about your soil microbiology and also to, to cultivate that as you move forward in your journey um, in food forests. So again, um, just looking at the layers of the forest garden itself, um, number one is the canopy, the tall trees. Number two is the sub canopy, um, large or large shrubs. Um, three is, you know, smaller shrubs. Uh, four is an herbaceous layer of herbs and different flowering plants. Um, five is ground cover. Six is um, basically that rhizome layer underground. You can't see it, but those are the different plants that grow underground. Um, and then uh, vertical climbers. And then this, um, this diagram doesn't include the um, mycorrhizal and the fungal layer, but the, that's an important element to this, um, to the way that these systems function as well. So I'm going to share um, a few um, examples of, of food forests and um, different varieties of plants that can be grown in, in these food forests and plants that um, if you're designing your own food forest plants for you to consider as well. So within the overstory canopy, um, if you're looking at fruit forests, um, utilizing and planting fruit trees, you'll look at locusts as being um, a desired plant for the overstory and locusts, um, whether they're New Mexico locusts, black locusts, um, there's many different varieties. They're all nitrogen fixing um, trees and they grow very, very tall. Um, and underneath um, the overstory is the mid story, which can consist of hazelnut service berries, dwarf fruit trees, elderberries, um, Siberian pea shrub. There's many, many different varieties. And, according and depending on where you are in the world, um, you wanna select different varieties for um, the specific region that you're living in. Um, understory plants, you can see the understory looking more like um, gooseberries, um, currants, rhubarb, um, different herbs. And as you go down into ground cover vines and within the swales themselves, there's, there's so many plants that can be included within the systems themselves. And I'll go over some of those plants and the plants that we are growing here in um, in Hopi as well. So if you're look if you're down in the Sonoran Desert in the lower desert portion or Chihuahua, Mexico, or in those different um, areas where the lower desert um, dwells, you'll see um, different guilds uh, emerge there. You'll see a mesquite guild where um, mesquite trees are often surrounded by elderberries, wolfberries, um, hackberries, um, chiltepines and um, jojoba, different desert plants it's themselves. So you'll see some of these guilds in natural systems and within these guilds, you can introduce other plants as well that um, are able to thrive in, in a low water um, system. And then if you look to the right, this is a, a more higher water system um, guilds, which consists of peach trees, of um, tomato, peppers, citrus, um, palms, jujubes. So there's different guilds that you can either plant or that already exist within your um, ecosystems. And these 
can be characterized as low water or medium water or high water intensive guilds as well. And so as we're moving and as we're facing some substantial issues with climate change, it's important when you're designing your systems and, and whatever um, structure that you're trying to build, it's important that you um, are cognizant of the limitations as well that exist within your um, region. So if we're looking at um, thriving systems and if we're really moving towards um, developing regenerative um, food systems, we have to be aware that there are substantial forces and practices that, um, that are counter to those efforts. And those um, are what I call deteriorating practices. So within our communities, we have significant issues with groundwater withdrawal which exceeds the recharge rate of our, of our natural aquifers and our natural system. So that's happening at a even higher rate than we've ever experienced before. Um, and also during rainy seasons, large quantities of water um, are running off the land. So there's um, substantial erosion um, happening within our territories as well, which um, leads to frequent droughts, which also lead to water scarcity within our regions and within our communities. Um, also modern farming practices that exist destroy the soil at 18 to 80 times faster than natural soil formation rates. And so basically within some of our practices of farming um, where we use uh, heavy machinery or tractors, um, those are actually um, can be um, very harmful to, um, to soil fertility, which leads to um, a decline, a serious decline in organic matter and soil fertility within our region. Um, also, um, when soil fertility goes down, um, there's a decrease in the amount of water that can infiltrate into the soil and the amount of water that can be stored within um, the soil itself. So there's many reasons why that's happening. We see uncontrolled grazing, widespread forest destruction, um, colonial practices um, that have been uh, imposed and introduced within our communities. Um, and those are associated as well with land theft and displa displacement of our communities and our people. Um, there's, there's just many, many negative um, impacts that we're facing right now as a community. And so it's important as we move forward to really think about um, those who are gonna come after us, um, the next generations, and what would our communities look like um, if we nurtured and we focused on the next generation um, to develop self leadership and capacity to learn and to practice our indigenous languages and cultures um, and to strengthen and restore our food systems um, and rekindle our trade routes and become land stewards as well. So that's really um, for myself, that's the work that I've been engaged in and that's the work that I'm gonna to continue to be involved in and that's the work that I um, ask of you to be involved in as well as you move forward. Um, so I'm gonna share um, my own distinct story of growing my own um, food forest here um, in Hopi in the high desert. So um, here's a few picked old pictures that I found. Um, and this is basically myself and my son um, Hawthorne here on the land that um, was gifted to my family by my great grandmother, which is basically two acres um, of, of unproductive agricultural land. At one time, it was a pretty productive um, area. It's within um, a distinct watershed. There's a small um, wash that runs next to it. But when um, we started um, building on this land, there was pretty much nothing. It was just, um, you know, there was no organic matter. The soil was very compacted. It was prone to erosion. Um, and where we live, we only receive nine to 11 inches of rain per year. And we're at about 6,300 um, feet in elevation. And so this area was um, just basically almost like a sand dune. There was things, it was very hard to grow anything here. It was, it was just um, really challenging all the time. And even when we began to grow fruit trees, um, those fruit trees didn't do well. Um, we had to really work hard to get things established here. Um, and it's been a while. So here's another picture of, um, of the area itself, um, the soil, and there was pretty much really um, um, not much growing here when we first started. 
So when we when we started thinking about um, what we wanted to do on this land, we wanted to grow food. We wanted to um, be able to 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 create a place um, that um, that our our kids could um, that our children and the next generations could. Um, could grow up and could thrive in. And so for myself, as I was growing up, I was, um, I had great grandparents who were farmers and they um, planted orchards and planted cornfields and, and there was always food. It just seemed like there was just always different types of food around. And so those memories are the memories that, um, that I wanted to be able to um, pass on to my own children. And so when we were looking at how to, um, develop systems, agricultural systems, and how to develop orchards on that land, um, the first thing that we looked at was um, the fact that um, in order for anything to grow, we needed to be able to, um, to have water, to cultivate water, and there was no water on that site at all, um, no plumbing or no, um, uh, no water at all, other than the rain that, that came every now and then. So we started looking at active and passive um, water harvesting systems. We started looking at rainwater collection. Um, as we we're building homes, we started looking at gray water um, and developing those systems. We started putting in rainwater earthworks, um, which included zuni bowls, swales, rock gabions, um, one rock dams, um, media lunas, and geoglyphs. So these are all different um, systems for active and passive water harvesting. And I don't have that much time to go over these systems technically in depth, but basically when our organization started running programming, we integrated our programming into the development of the land itself. So um, with our students, we began to teach them and to develop um, water harvesting earthworks. On the left is a um, water harvesting earthwork, which is called a Zuni bowl, which was actually developed by the Zuni Pueblo people in New Mexico. They developed some um, pretty uh, intensive earthwork systems along their land and within their tributaries. So these systems actually slow down water so that it can infiltrate. They create um, sinks where water can infiltrate and, um, and sink into um, to the landscape and to the system itself. Um, we also began to dig swales. On the right is, um, is a large scale swale system, um, which basically we dig uh, the land out and then with the soil that is um, dug out, it's put on top, um, back on top to develop this, uh, this um, situation, a sunken uh, area where water can infiltrate as well. Um, so we did a lot of Zuni bowls and a lot of swales. Um, within the land we observed and looked at how water was flowing off of the landscape itself and um, how we could start to develop um, and put in place different really simple systems to slow down water to have it infiltrate and to seed along um, along the pathway as well of of those earthworks that we um, wanted to create or wanted to utilize because before when water would fall it would just fall and it would just um, create erosion and then it would go away. It wasn't staying on the land so we spent a significant time actually putting in a lot of these earthwork systems and you can see these systems um, in place all over um, the world really and especially in dry land areas but you look at um, boomerang systems. These are basically swale systems that um, are harvesting water off of uh, a landscape, off of uh, a topography. They're all placed on a contour. And so basically water is spread out through these systems and it's able to be infiltrated um, and planted into the land so that um, your plantings will be able to, your trees and other things can be able to thrive in these systems. Um, one other thing that we did, um, besides building all these uh, earthworks and doing passive and active rainwater harvesting, was that we brought in tons of mulch and organic matter. So we live near one of the largest um, ponderosa pine forests in North America. So we um, frequently go there and visit the forest and we bring back, uh, we started bringing back just tons of mulch um, in our trailer and began um, putting organic matter onto the land itself. Um, within our living habits, we were 
always looking at um, developing soil fertility. So we did that through composting kitchen scraps um, and also food processing residue, um, plant material and manure. Um, we began making um, biochar and tierra preta, which is a distinct type of soil that you um, can create yourself. Um, and it basically um, is a type of um, a char system that creates a larger surface area for little microbes and fungal communications to be developed within your system itself and you just put out on the landscape. So we did a lot of that and we still do those things. Um, we began integrating wildlife and animals into the system. We got turkeys and um, chickens. Uh, we began uh, developing gardens and, and small food producing areas and we started rotating our crops. So we develop a, a good um, crop rotation system. Um, we also uh, learned how to prepare fermented herbal tea preparations. So we would prepare those and feed the soil. Um, intensive mulching, we did a lot. We still do a lot of that mulching um, and also reusing water in all of the homes that we've built on this land. Um, they all have intensive green water, uh, gray water systems as well as rainwater harvesting systems. So um, there's just tons that you can do. So initially we planted, um, we planted fruit trees on the site and a lot of the fruit trees that we planted, we actually purchased from off reservations from nurseries. And many of those fruit trees actually didn't do well. Uh, most of them actually died after maybe a year or two um, just because of the conditions and as well, the, the trees weren't adapted to the area. So we began um, collecting uh, seeds that grow um, in Hopi, seeds that have been um, grown here for many, many um, generations. And we have distinct Hopi peach um, and apricot and plum varieties that have that we've grown for quite a long time now. So um, we began saving those seeds and, um, and farmers were sharing those seeds with us. And we started our own small nursery, which we still operate today. Um, and so many of our peach trees and our plums um, and apricots are grown from seeds. So, um, so every year we're, we're growing new seedlings and these actually seedlings grow really fast and they're um, adapted to the soil, the dry land soil conditions. And we develop our own um, drought tolerant um, soil mixtures and so, um, these trees actually were the trees that we um, planted on the land and these trees are actually um, the trees that do best um, within our region. So we, um, we have a nursery where we grow the um, Hopi apricots and different varieties of, of trees and they're very fast growing. And then we also begin taking cuttings of vines and locust trees and cottonwoods and different plants as uh, different um, cuttings from trees and plants within our region and we be begin um, propagating them and growing out our own cuttings. Um, and so from those seedlings and propagated plants, we begin uh, planting them on the land itself. So you can see in this photo, so when we first started, um, when we first started planting, this was about uh, nine years ago. And so you can see a lot of the things that we are planting are like little sticks or little tiny trees. And that's because these are um, trees that we grew um, on our own and we just um, planted them and, and um, really uh, they took off basically. So when we started planting um, within this region, we started with um, with fruit trees and with honey locusts. So um, we have on, on the two acres, about 110 fruit trees with about 30 different varieties of fruit trees, as well as um, here in this photo, there's um, the smaller seedlings, the fruit trees, and we did put in some currants and you can see the earthworks. Um, they're kind of in a snake shape here. So this is kind of when we first started getting going and we built a house and we integrated the rainwater harvesting and um, into the system itself. Um, and as we um, went through, we also um, integrated composting systems into the orchard. So you'll see these um, weird looking green um, containers along the orchards and those were actually composting um, systems that we had in place. And so we lift them and spread them 
out on the land itself and that really improved um, the, the soil itself. Um, once we integrated chickens and turkeys and rabbits into the land, um, we saw a huge increase in soil fertility and the um, plants that we were transplanting and the seedlings that we were putting into the landscape themselves just began to just grow like crazy. Everything just, um, it, it felt like once the animals, um, the chickens and our little helpers got on the land that everything just came to life really, really quick. So they helped us um, in the process and we just watched year after year, we added more mulch and improved our swales and um, added a few things every year into the system, either seeds or transplants. Um, we put in some, um, nitrogen fixing uh, Siberian pea shrubs and other plants um, into the system to help it further along. Um, and it just kept growing. It just, this um, area, um, two acre area just kept growing. Everything that we planted did well. And with everything that we added into the system, it just um, was thriving year after year. And, and uh, what was more surprising is that Every year since we've started growing um, our food forests, there's been less and less moisture within the region itself. And so the earthworks um, are the primary um, water source for this system. And also we do have um, irrigation with rainwater um, collection with active rainwater harvesting collection too. So this orchard receives um, irrigation at least um, once a month when we have um, rain or we have lots of water, but otherwise, um, it's moving towards a system that is um, no longer um, irrigated. And so throughout the seasons, um, we also see, see a huge um, uh, increase in resiliency of these different of the different varieties of fruit trees that we have on the land themselves. And so um, we see that some varieties um, that we've introduced um, will bloom earlier or they'll bloom later. Um, a lot of the varieties that we grow from seed or that we propagate um, through grafting, those varieties are a lot hardier and so they can actually withstand, um, the, the fruit bloom can withstand freezing temperatures um, a lot better than some of the other introduced um, trees that we've put onto the landscape itself. Um, so this tree, or this tree, this picture was taken, um, I think this, actually this past summer. So you can see um, from the little sticks uh, that you saw in the beginning, this system is really um, beginning to, um, to grow and to thrive and uh, everything that was planted here added to the system is, is really becoming um, you know, more mature. Um, and so if you, if you look at this picture, we have the fruit trees, we have honey locusts as well. We have willows, globe willows, um, currants, gooseberries, um, sand cherries, nanking cherries, artichokes, strawberries, mints. There's a lot of plants that are growing in these systems. And so when we first got started, we would just add things every year. We would cultivate plants um, and we would um, purchase some plants from nearby nurseries as well. And we just plant things there. Um, and then also we made seed balls and um, with seeds inside of them, native seeds, and we toss them out and they would grow. So we have lots of Rocky Mountain beeweed growing, um, native sunflowers and a lot of different um, milkweeds that are growing right now too. Um, and then we introduced many different varieties of drought tolerant um, uh, fruits as well, like um, golden currants, wax currants, gooseberries, black currants, rose hips, um, sumac. There's just a ton of, um, of berries and, per and perennial, um, small perennial fruiting shrubs that you can add to the system. And we did all that. Many of these we actually took from cuttings and we did vegetative propagation, grew them in pots. And then once they got a little big, then we put them out there into the landscape and they just grew and they produce so much food. It's really amazing to see, um, you know, the amount of harvest and these systems are resilient in that they, um, some of those smaller shrubs like the currants and um, the gooseberries, all of those um, produce fruit, whether there's a frost or not, even if it's a hard frost or so hardy, you'll, you'll get a harvest no matter what, um, as well as we, you know, every year we have swarms of bees coming in and 
just the system is just so productive and it's just so beautiful to be able to harvest and to, um, to interact with it and to just continually um, be nourished by this system. It's amazing. And some years we have tons of fruit and other years we won't have that much fruit, but, um, but something's always producing um, within the system itself. So um, I didn't have I didn't have a lot of time today to present um, some of the more technical aspects to you all. But um, if you're ever, you know, in this region, I know we're facing some substantial issues with COVID-19, um, but, at, but at a certain point, um, if folks are interested in coming and visiting us, um, you know, we are open to that. And, and it's just an amazing um, blessing to be a part of a system that is thriving and that is, um, and that is a resilient system itself. So um, I have a lot of more technical things that I'd like to share with you, but I think we're pretty much out of time. Are we out of time, um, Kaylee and Colleen? Yeah, so we have about eight minutes left before we were planning to move on to the Q&A period. Um, okay, great. Keep going for a little bit longer or we can move on. Okay, I can go from, okay, I can go on for maybe like five more minutes. Okay, sounds good. Um, and okay, folks, great, just so you know, um, if you could vote for your favorite questions in the Q&A box, we can start to narrow down the list of uh, what we'd like to ask Lillian today. All right, handing it great. back. Thanks. Okay, great. And so, um, so my husband and I, um, along with our students and our, our family, we have um, a small nursery on the land that we, we, we live and we work on. And um, we also uh, have planted a substantial amount of trees, not only on this site, but throughout the Hopi Reservation and even throughout the region. And so fruit trees are some things that we really enjoy growing and that we enjoy sharing with folks. So there's just so much, um, you know, so many reasons why we plant fruit trees themselves. Um, and I know that there's just so much value in planting trees in general. So um, I think in my lifetime, I've probably um, planted enough trees to for my own self as well as for my grandchildren and for probably my great grandchildren because there's you know only so much you can do in your lifetime but by planting trees um, that's ensuring you know that you're thinking about the next generations and and down the line and so that's something that I find um, a lot of pleasure in and that I I'm just honored continually to do this work. Um, and so our fruit trees, I just want to share with you a little bit about the, um, the fruit trees that we grow. So we caretake a small um, community nursery where we grow many different varieties of fruit trees from seeds um, that are collected and shared locally. Um, occasionally, we, we will graft heirloom varieties onto drought tolerant rootstock, which we also grow. Um, and as a way to continue unique fruit varieties that have been cultivated by our own community for many, many generations. Um, we also work with regional fruit tree nurseries to source um, bare root fruit tree seedlings um, and those we offer to the community at a discounted rate um, to raise money for the organization's work. Um, and we also mix our own dry land adapted potting soil um, where we bed our trees in and we feed all of the trees with our own cultivated compost and worm ca casting mix. Um, and in this way, we ensure that our trees start their lives in a healthy um, soil, um, drought tolerant, nutrient rich soil. So every year um, we grow quite a bit as well as um, within our nursery, we strive to build um, solidarity and equity. And we always are challenging, wanting to challenge neoliberalism and capitalism. So we offer the opportunity for individuals to purchase fruit tree and plant start solidarity shares that are offered to um, indigenous farmers and growers in our region. Um, and so in that way, we're trying to cultivate um, equity and, and um, you know, an economy that is um, based around sharing as well. So I have all this technical stuff on how to plant a fruit tree. So there's all these specific ways that we've developed to plant trees and it's just so much fun so if you look at um, growing your own fruit tree guilds there's just so many resources out there but basically um, the guilds you can um, develop and plant your own guilds using a fruit tree as a 
as a central el element and at our learning site here in Kikwitzmobi, we've created different fruit tree guilds um, around peach cherries, pears and apple trees. Um, and we just watch as those different guilds grow and, and expand and, and do well. So there's a lot of different plants that you can establish within your fruit tree guild that'll attract beneficial pollinators, deter pests and wildlife, um, build mulch and fertilize soil and produce um, medicine and food. And so there's just so many different elements that you can put into your guilds and they all, once they're established, they all work well and develop this stable resilient system. That's just so fun and beautiful to just watch and to be a part of. So um, there's a lot of examples of different guilds. There's apple tree guilds um, where you can, you know, bring in different types of plants and pollinators um, within those systems themselves, um, within the apple tree guilds. Um, and within food forest, you're always using um, an anchor tree, a tree that will serve as a canopy or as a top layer. Um, and then you add all of the different um, plants underneath it. You add all of those different varieties and they grow, some grow, some don't. And when they do, it's just so, it's just beautiful to watch and to just be a part of it all. And um, you know, once you plant your guilds, they are perennial and so they don't require reseeding. Um, if they take hold, they'll grow, expand and continue to flourish for many years. And as they evolve, you'll find that you'll have many plants um, to grow more guilds or to share with others. So the plants that we've grown and put in place, they usually reproduce and regenerate and we, we pull them up, um, we transplant them to different areas and make more guilds. So we're just constantly, um, moving things around and trying new things and it's just it's awesome and once um, once we started planting all of these trees and all of these plants started growing we saw you know just an abundance of birds and bees and hummingbirds and little chipmunks and all different types of snakes and just just the life is just amazing and beautiful so if you if you're in these in this space during um, the summertime when everything's just so green and full and maybe we got a little rain, the, the place is just amazing. It's just humming with life and it's just so, it's just beautiful and I'm just totally honored. But once you start growing these systems, you won't have any privacy because we're always getting like birds looking in the windows or chipmunks scratching at the door. And so there's like, once you once you start growing these systems, you're pretty much never alone, which is cool. But at the same time, it's a little bit creepy when you're changing and you see a squirrel knocking on your window. But um, anyway, it's, it's a lot of fun. And um, and I could just talk all day about these um, about these systems and it's just it's just amazing. Um, and so my contact info's here and um, to learn more, check out our website. And uh, if anyone has questions, I can answer those as well. I know I went through it really fast. I have just a ton of information, but we just there's just never enough time. so um, I'll go ahead and answer or filled any questions that folks may have. Thank you so much, Lillian. That was just so beautiful. And I know we're also honored to be able to sit in and hear you share your story and your knowledge. Um, so we have one person wondering if you can go back to your contact info page really quick. Okay. Um, and so we're going to transition into our question and answer session right now. Um, and as a little segue, we'd like to do our first of three uh, door prize awardings. Um, so as we mentioned, we're gonna ask two questions based on the content that Lillian has shared with us. Um, and the first person to answer the question correctly in the chat box will win um, the door prize. So give everybody a second to get ready. We're gonna share our first question now. And then we're gonna do question and answer with Lillian and then do another door prize question um, at the very end. So our first question here is what are guilds? What is a guild? So if you know the answer, share it in the chat and you can possibly win a door prize. Alrighty, I think we already, we have our winner. Um, 
Thank you guys. We'll be in touch again with those who win the door prize, door prizes. And um, if you didn't get it this time, we still have a couple more to award. Okay, um, so Lillian, we have a few questions for you. Are you ready? Yep. Okay, so first question, Matt would like to know, what do you think are the main parts of a decolonizing approach to developing and working with food forests? Yeah, I think, um, you know, as far as decolonizing, I think it's important for, um, for folks to be able to consider their own relationship or their people's relationship to the land and to, um, and, and to their food sources. And I think once people are able to have a deeper understanding of their own connection to, um, to the land where they're living or the lands where, where their people um, emerged or the origin places of, of their people, I think their people will be able to have a better understanding of, of how to um, go about either planting food forests or even managing um, forests that are already existing um, in our traditional territories. So, I shared with you all um, a lot of the work that that my family did around um, planting and, and actively developing a human designed um, food forest, but also um, a lot of my time is spent out on the land in um, within our traditional territories, um, actively managing and harvesting and um, and engaging with um, with the forests that my own people have cultivated um, many, many generations ago, but have been displaced from. So it's our responsibility um, to be able to access these places and to develop a relationship with them and to um, ensure that they're, um, that they're given the proper offerings and that they're, um, you know, respectfully, um, I guess respectfully visited and, and managed um, into the future and also to teach the, the next generations about um, their responsibility and role in, um, in stewarding um, lands as well. Thanks, thank you for that answer. Um, next question is from Leah Zies. Uh, she asks, how have you approached equipment for these projects? Um, our small farm has had difficulty finding affordable equipment. Um, so she's wondering how you faced that challenge and how you overcame it. She also says hi. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hi. Hi, Leah. Nice to hear from you. Uh, yeah, I think for, uh, for the work that we do within the community, we, the only heavy equipment that we actually utilize is a truck and a, and a trailer. And we utilize that to haul mulch and other things um, from place to place and all of the work that we've done on the land and that we continue to do is done with hand tools. It's manually, um, we, don't use, done, we don't use any equipment, heavy machinery or anything at all. And we're able to do that because um, we involve a lot of people, a massive amount of people in the work that we do. And so throughout the seasons, we're able to put in, um, different, you know, large scale systems or plant um, an abundance of trees or, or lots of seeds because we have um, the, the manpower to do it. So that's how we've been able to, um, to navigate that. And, and I know that doesn't answer your question, Leah, we just don't use heavy equipment and we try not to um, move forward. So we just don't need it. So um, Corinne would like to know um, how other members of the BIPOC community can support Indigenous people. Um, and she's also wondering if there are guiding principles that guide food forests and foraging for collecting. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I haven't really seen a lot of those guidelines or frameworks um, be established. So I think that that's something that can be done, um, that work can and needs to be done in order for us as a people to articulate our own goals and our own uh, needs moving forward and the visions that we want to see and, that, and how we want to engage in this work. So. I think that um, you know that work is yet to be done, and I think it exists already. Um, a lot of these frameworks and guidelines they exist within our traditional um, languages and our stories. So I think that um, because many of our societies are uh, oral, um, 
living oral communities, we can't, we haven't really articulated that or put that down into a workable framework. So I think that that's the work ahead of us is to clearly articulate, um, you know, what these, what, what this means to us and how we're going to um, be able to interact with these, with these systems. So, so I'm excited to see um, folks work on that and see how that emerges. Okay, this is pretty rapid fire. So thank you again for, for um, answering everyone's questions. I know, you know, everybody's got a lot that they're wondering about. Um, Cameron would like to know what are the largest organizational, financial or structural challenges you have faced in operating Hopi Tetsuwa permaculture and creating, maintaining your food forest? Um, how have you worked through them? Okay. So I think initially, um, initially some of the challenges that we um, that we faced and that we still continue to face are, are associated with, um, I guess, lack of support from from our tribal nation itself and from you know even from village governments and from you know entities that may have access to um, financial resources as well as administrative resources to um, to move this work forward in a I guess in a more um, on another scale than than the work that we've been doing which is mainly community based um, with families and with individuals and um, sometimes with villages but at the same time it, it feels um, like this work isn't really a priority to our nation, um, but it should be because, you know, as we move into and as we navigate through at certain times, um, you know, any, uh, and if we really look in retrospect at the dependency and the fragility that we face um, in being dependent on food systems that we don't have control over or that we are not, you know, uh, engaged with, um, you know, any type of disruption to transportation or, or changes in climate or cycles are going to create a hardship for us in the future. So I think, you know, moving forward, this work needs to be scaled um, appropriately to um, meet the needs and the demand of our community, not only now, but into the future. And by community, I mean nations uh, among our own nations. Um, food sovereignty needs to be a, a priority within our um, within our, our governments, within, um, within our society and within our system. So it's been, you know, challenging to be able to get support for the work that we do. But on the other hand, we don't need a lot of resources. Um, when you look at um, the work that needs to be done with farming and building food systems, really, um, a lot of that work has to do with um, engaging people and with creating, um, you know, the the situations and the opportunities for people to um, to develop and, and to learn um, how to move these systems forward. So I think it's just, you know, the school systems and um, the governmental systems, there's just no connection between these systems and our, um, our children are not, you know, really engaged in learning this important knowledge and, and moving it forward and it's not a priority. So um, so as an institute, we are kind of always under the radar and, and trying to work to develop different um, projects and different uh, cooperatives or CSAs and different things mainly, um, and a lot of times without the support of, um, of large, of our tribal government. So that, that's been challenging. Okay, I think this is going to be the last question that we'll have time for. Um, uh, so Sanjay would like to know how many people in your community can live off of the food that are, oh, sorry, I'll rephrase. How many people in the community can live off of the food grown in the two acres? Um, and additionally, he'd like to know what are the Three Sisters Guild varieties that work best for you? Okay. I've never, we've never really done an audit to see, you know, how um, many individuals can be sustained off of this two acre um, plot of land? Um, that's a great question. Um, but I think within our programming and the work that we do, we share um, food and we share, um, you know, harvest um, from the land with, with numerous people, with students, with community 
Um, we also are part of a community supported agriculture where we um, provide food um, on a seasonal basis and we grow thousands of plant starts and thousands of fruit trees. So when you look at kind of the multiplier effect of all of those plants and trees that we're sending out into the world, I think that the the, the quantifying of that is just kind of beyond me. I'm not a real, a, a real person who's good at quantifying things. Um, but I think that's a good thing that needs to be done. And maybe I'll find somebody who can help me do it. But but the um, for, for an average family or an extended family of potentially five to 10 people, I think um, two acres is, is, you know, more than enough land to be able to provide the majority of needs of the food needs for for a family of five to 10 people, I would think is way too much food for us to eat um, or even preserve. So um, we're sharing it or preserving it. So the potential is limitless, I think. Um, and the second question was um, the, the, the guilds themselves. There's so many guilds that I deal with. It's just crazy. I don't know which ones are my favorite, but I think um, amaranth, um, blue corn, sunflower, um, purple string bean and um, what's the other one? Oh, and Jerusalem artichoke. I think those are my kind of favorite ones. I don't grow the Jerusalem artichokes in the gardens, but I grow them near them. And I think those, you know, annual crops are just beautiful. And those are the ones that I usually grow together. Um, also tomatoes, basil and sweet onions are another guilt that I like to plant. Um, perennial guilds, I like to do um, peach trees with strawberries, artichokes, oregano, um, uh, gooseberries, uh, currants, and um, probably Siberian pea shrubs. So there's just so many. I, yeah, but those are some of my favorites. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Lillian, for sharing all of this with us. Um, so we're going to start wrapping up here now. Um, but first, we have uh, one more door prize to give out. And then um, I'll be handing it over to you, Clayton, uh, to wrap us up here and to make the announcement about the next presentation in this series. Um, as a reminder, this is the first webinar of several um, presentations that are going to be offered by TANAFA and NAFSA. Um, so please stay in touch with us, stay in touch with everyone's social media um, so that you don't miss out on any future sessions. Um, okay, so our last door prize question uh, is what are the layers of a food forest? If you know, um, feel free to drop that in the chat first person to name all of the layers. It's a little bit more challenging this question. Um, first person who can name all of them uh, will get our last door prize. Okay, getting close. I think I'm still waiting on somebody to get all of the layers. Okay, and, and while we're waiting, um, Clayton, did you want to take it from here and and uh, start and talk more about uh, next week and wrap us up? Yeah, I can do that. Um, everybody can hear me. I'm hoping. Um, well, I want to thank everybody for participating today. Uh, this is, like I said, the, the first of uh, a number of a series. I haven't confirmed the actual number, but it looks like maybe about six. We have uh, one scheduled for next week already. Um, uh, growing adaption through cooperation. Uh, citizen uh, Leah Zies, citizen of Oneida Nation, will be sharing how Oneida families are addressing climate change through grassroots collective farming. Um, I was, um, I, I, 
in my, I guess my education of, um, of getting into agriculture, it goes way back. And um, as a young man, I was able to uh, travel and visit on a lot of different farms, uh, both uh, native indigenous farms and other um, family, um, non, non-native farms. <clears throat> and trying to learn what I could about um, uh, agriculture. And um, to me, it seemed like without fail, um, when I would talk with especially the uh, native farmers, uh, the first thing they would, um, I guess, emphasize and focus on is how our um, communities, our farming communities, farming families, um, helped and supported each other. And um, to some degree that's still happening, but um, uh, it's not as uh, prevalent or as strong as it um, once was. Um, <clears throat> uh, Lillian kind of spoke on that, you know, we're looking at, um, uh, in some cases we have to replace manpower with uh, machinery. And, um, you know, I think we um, you need to start looking at um, ways of um, um, creating um, cooperative models. And that's uh, next week, that's what's gonna be covered uh, to some extent. Um, so anyways, um, there are still a lot of questions out there. Um, maybe you could uh, address them directly to Lillian or myself and, um, you know, take, um, um, you know, uh, to, um, I guess, learn and understand even more of uh, what was covered today. I thank you Lillian for being so um, uh, concise, exacting and um, uplifting, inspiring. Um, I was going to mention earlier, if you look up the word hardworking in the dictionary, you'll find a photograph of Lillian and her family. So thank you. Uh, I guess that's the end of today. Um, I, unless anybody else had, um, uh, I guess that's the end, uh, end of um, today's discussion. We're right at the uh, cutoff point here, it looks like. So uh, thank you all, and hopefully we'll see everyone next week. Send me whoever um, was keeping track of the door prize winners. Uh, send me their names and a mailing address, and I'll get the uh, prizes out to you ASAP. Thank you. Okay, will do. Um, and yeah, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Clayton and Lillian, again, for organizing um, keep an eye on your email inboxes. We'll be sending out uh, a link to the recording, which will be posted on the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance's YouTube page this Friday. Um, and in that email, we'll also be sure to include contact information and everybody's websites so that you can keep in touch. Okay. Well, share, this with, share this with your uh, friends and family or, and others. Yes, definitely. I guess with that, we'll say uh, say goodbye to everybody. Uh, we hope you stay safe and well and take care out there. Kunta uh, woha. Sengiri ho. Sengiri ho. Thanks, Lily. Right.